The broadcast of the regular meeting of the City Council will now begin. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Bender. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council. I'm going to call this regular meeting of the City Council for April 10th to order. As we begin, I'll note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members of the City Council and City staff as authorized under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021 due to the declared local public health emergency. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Council Member Gordon. Here. Council Member Cano. Here. Council Member Reich. Present. Council Member Fletcher. Here. Council Vice President Jenkins. Here. Council Member Schrader. Here. Council Member Cunningham. Council Member Ellison. Present. Council Member Goodman. Present. Council Member Johnson. Here. Council Member Palmasano. Present. Council Member Cunningham. Is absent. Council President Bender. Here. There are 11 members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. Colleagues, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. Are there any amendments from council members to the agenda? Seeing none, I will just note that our LIM system that we use to create and track agendas puts our items in a particular order. And for this week and each week going forward, my intention will be to begin with the mayor's report on the local public health emergency. So I'll just note that for today, but as well as um, going forward for each of our meetings while we're under the declared local emergency. So if there are no objections, I will move adoption of the agenda in that order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Connor. Aye. Wright. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Council Vice President Jenkins. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and the agenda is adopted. Next, we have the minutes from our regular meeting on March 27th and the minutes of the April 3rd adjourned meeting. May I have a motion to accept those minutes? So moved, Madam Chair. Second. That has been moved and seconded. The clerk will call the roll on the acceptance of those minutes. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Hano. Aye. Reich. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Council Vice President Jenkins. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Almasano. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and those minutes are accepted. Next, we have the referral of petitions, communications, and reports to the proper committees. May I have that motion, please? So moved. Second. The clerk will call the roll on those referrals. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Vice President Jenkins. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmasano. Aye. Council President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and those referrals are made. With that, we'll proceed to the order of new business first and invite the mayor to provide his weekly report on the state of local health emergency. Welcome, Mayor Fry. Thanks for being here today. Thank you so much, Madam President. Uh, again, I really appreciate the ongoing collaboration and the opportunity to join all of you here today. I'm, I'm also impressed with how fluid we're getting with the technology. Uh, seems like we're improving by leaps and bounds every single day. And so uh, I think you'll be appreciative that this week is gonna be a bit shorter than last, but we do have some new information and I'll do my best to pause 
uh, now and again to take any questions that you may have. Uh, there have been nine uh, emergency regulations that have been issued to date uh, across the city. Again, the emergency declaration was issued on March 16th, uh, and since then there have been nine. The new emergency regulation, or I should say rescission of an emergency regulation, uh, happened just yesterday, and that was rescinding regulation number 2020-4, uh, which prevented new land applications from going through. Now that we have our technology set up, now that we're able to take public feedback remotely, and now that our city staff is prepared to take new applications, we can rescind that previous emergency regulation, thus uh, allowing the, the process to continue on a somewhat normal basis and allow the council to, to continue doing their work uh, around land use. Uh, on health, the, the numbers, as you're aware, are increasing. That should be anticipated anticipated deaths have approximately tripled uh, since last time we spoke. That was also anticipated. Uh, we are also seeing some real progress and some, some hopes in that we're hitting some high marks in the entire country. Uh, we're seeing about 17 cases per 100,000 in the state of Minnesota, and we're uh, just around there as well in the in the city of Minneapolis. That number has gone up, obviously, since that statistic was released. But um, the the bottom line is that our city and our state are are outperforming most others at that point. Uh, and that's something to be proud of, but it also shows that we need to continue to do the hard work around social distancing that we've already enacted. Uh, the total approximate number of completed tests thus far is 32,294. The total approximate number of completed tests from the MDH public health is 9,000, and the completed external laboratory tests are around 23,000. The total positive tests as of yesterday were 1,242, that's in the state of Minnesota. Uh, patients who no longer need to be isolated are at 675. So around half of that. Um, again, we're seeing uh, deaths around 50, uh, Hennepin County positive uh, cases around 375. Minneapolis presently has 131 positive cases that we're aware of as of the last report. Um, the total number of cases requiring hospitalization are 293. Hospitalized as of today is 145. And then there are 63 uh, cases hospitalized in the I, in an ICU as of today. So as far as general updates uh, in public health, uh, right now it is uh, National Public Health Week, and it's seemingly more important than ever to thank the healthcare workers for supporting our community in really tough times. They do incredible work. Uh, also a big thanks to all of our first responders, firefighters and police officers and our inspectors, those who are just out there on a regular basis while many of us are working remotely. They're still out in the field and uh, they are encountering more danger than many of the rest of us on, an, on a daily basis and they need to be thanked for it. The health department is directly distributing a limited number of supplies and that's PPE, sanitation supplies, thermometers, and those supplies are being uh, dispersed to healthcare partners, to 64 senior and assist, assisted living facilities, to people experiencing homelessness, uh, school settings and other community organizations, as well as city staff who need it. And that obviously includes MPD, MFD, fire department, and, uh, and our inspectors. Additional outreach with Smaller convenience and corner stores were conducted the first days of April uh, in a follow up to an earlier outreach uh, that saw a sweep to 175 licensed facilities to provide guidance on COVID and physical distancing. We want to make sure that everybody has the right information. And one of the best ways to do that is by making sure that this outreach and education is taking place on a very regular basis. Uh, we've established a donation hub as well. Uh, thanks both to council members as well as city staff. Uh, the health department has established this hub to connect those with uh, capacity and resources to those with complementary needs. We will help catalog what is available and what is needed and then connect people on each side to find the needed resource. Uh, the city is managing donations of items and that's other than personal protective equipment. 
which can be donated through Hennepin County. Um, as far as personal protect, protective equipment goes, we are in constant collaboration with the state, making sure that resources are deployed to those that need it most and making sure that we have the proper amount of PPE when our peak reach, reaches its height. I will stop there um, and next, next I'll be going into the Office of Emergency Management and Workforce Report, but I'll stop there just for a, a second to answer any questions that people may have. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I um, I know that a number of council offices have asked during the um, check-in meetings that staff have about our ability to track data based on race equity and race racial demographic data. And I know that request has gone in. Do you or the health department staff know any more about our ability to get that data based on race? We have heard the request and I think it makes complete sense. Uh, we should be tracking based on demographic and race. And I, I don't have the data before me, but if Commissioner Musicant could respond, that would be great. Yes, uh, thank you for the for the question. Um, we have been uh, working to get the State Health Department to release that level of data for a municipality. And as our cases have gone up, I think the likelihood of them releasing more uh, details to us is is heightened. I was um, able to directly ask the Commissioner of Health uh, at the state yesterday, and um, my request was warmly received by her. I have instructed my staff who have been advocating staff to staff uh, for some time for that data to see if there's any action or motion uh, yet today. And um, if not, I will uh, directly appeal to the commissioner again. But I, I foresee that within uh, a number of days, we should be able to begin to have that data and show it to you and um, analyze it and have it direct our work. Thank you both. There are a number of council members in queue. I just wanted to note that as we've seen the data coming through, I've noticed that our proportion of the existing data uh, shows that the, pop, the proportion of folks living in Minneapolis with a positive test is equal to our proportion, both of the county as a percentage of our population in the county and as our proportion of the population in the state. So at least with the data we have, knowing that testing is limited, um, you know, our rate of, of positive tests in the city is equal to our proportion of, of the population in, in the county and the state. So um, I think it, it just, speaks to I think the effectiveness of all of the strategies that we have in place and just wanted to thank you both for all of the work that you're doing. Um, so we have council member Fletcher and then a number of other council members in queue. Thank you council president and uh, thank you mayor for this uh, presentation. One thing I'm hoping we can get clarified as a part of this presentation and this may be more for director music than for the mayor uh is it seems like the guidance has changed since last week on wearing uh masks when uh we're going out into the world and i've gotten some questions from constituents who are confused about that uh and who also are wondering where they can get them and so i'm wondering what we're doing both to make masks available to the extent that we are recommending them uh when people are making their trips to the grocery store or, or whatever essential uh outings they have to do uh, and if you can just clarify for us what the current guidance is from the city. Council member, you are correct. The guidance has changed both from the CDC as well as from the state in the last week or week and a half or so. Um, and Commissioner, feel free to correct me if, if what I say is wrong, but my understanding is that uh, people are advised to wear a mask when they're going into public uh, situations, especially like a grocery store where you're likely to come into contact with a a certain congregation or density of people. Um, you, of course, don't need to wear a mask if you're out on your own. Uh, Commissioner, is that is that accurate? Yes, thank you, um, Mayor, um, Council President, uh, City Council Member uh, Fletcher. The, uh, the recommendation for cloth masks, and it's cloth masks, um, so these are not surgical masks, they're not the N95 masks, is really because um, as we learn more about the virus, we're seeing that there are some uh, folks before they are symptomatic who are spreading the, the virus. And so 
in order for us to protect others from us, we are asked to wear the masks. So it's uh, we know that um, when we speak, uh, even when we breathe, we're releasing little particles. And so the, the cloth mask will stop those from spreading. And so that is uh, why we are asking people to wear that. We still encourage people to keep the six feet of distance and to wash their hands um, frequently. But uh, yes, if you're going to say uh, the checkout at the grocery store, um, you're going to the pick up your dry cleaning, um, places the essential businesses where you need to get closer than six feet with someone, it is really a, a, a help to them um, and a kindness to others to wear a mask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. We have Council Member Palmasano, then Gordon, then Council Vice President. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just curious if to switch topics a little bit here, could you tell us more about the land use application process? I've had several conversations this week with constituents who are eager to get to their, you know, their summer project. Maybe it's an ADU application, a garage application. These are small kinds of things that residents and their, you know, their smaller contractors typically go into the PDR desk um, for assistance. And I'm just curious how that process is restarting. And I thought maybe it wouldn't be a question for the mayor, but more director Frank. Madam President, Council Member Palmasano, uh, yes, that is correct. There were two facets that were largely preventing us from moving forward with additional land use applications. The first was the technology component, ensuring that we could actually have public meetings and have community input prior to the 60 day time period terminating. The second piece was just making sure that our staff could actually handle applications giving uh, the influx and just change in all of our the way we're doing business um, my understanding is that it can now be done electronically in other words you can apply electronically rather than going into the desk like uh, is often done um, but i'm going to uh, turn it over to david frank perhaps to clarify thank you mayor uh, councilmember palmasano to your question just as the mayor said, we have been moving aggressively over the past uh, few years towards electronic submission of land use applications. And in light of the emergency, we have accelerated that even more. And although the counter will remain closed for the duration of the governor's now extended uh, uh, stay at home order, we do have people at the counter, not at the counter, but in the office um, several times a week for about an hour to pick up any paper plans that have come in. And then we are able to process them using our electronic system once they've been dropped off. So we think we can handle uh, all the applications in whatever format that they come in. If I may, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Um, is there a is there is this indicated on the website that normally gives our PDR desk information or how how do they know where to send these applications? Uh, Madam President, Councilmember Palmasano, yes, I believe it is. But um, as soon as I finish answering your question, I'll go I'll go look for myself. I know we also have signs um, physically in the office in case anybody hasn't found out any other way saying here is how you can do it electronically. Um, just in, as a last resort, I also believe we have sent messages to all of our distribution lists, anybody we've had um, workings with in the past, local architecture firms and the like. So, and we can easily include it in some upcoming communication as well. We're casting as wide a net as we can to say people should not be coming downtown to do this now during the governor's stay at home order. And in the meantime, here's how they can do things, but I'll go confirm myself right now. Thank you very much. Thank you both. We have Councilmember Gordon. Thank you very much, President Bender. I noticed in today's report that we had some Minneapolis specific information about um, cases. Um, I don't know that we'd seen um, Minneapolis specific information on positive cases, which makes me curious and I'm sure others will be curious as well as uh, do, do we have numbers on how many have been hospitalized, how many are in intensive care, and also the number of fatalities um, that have occurred in Minneapolis. And if not, um, do you think we can anticipate getting those soon? And maybe uh, that's uh, Comm Commissioner Musicant has a better answer than anybody on that. I don't know. But the mayor, go ahead. Madam President, Council Member Gordon, 
Uh, you are correct. We did have information as to the number of Minneapolis residents that have contracted COVID-19 in this presentation. That same statistic was also in last week's presentation, uh, albeit a lower number, of course. Uh, I am not aware of any data beyond the number of Minneapolis residents that have contracted, uh, but Commissioner Musicant, perhaps you can chime in. Uh, yes, thank you for that uh, question, um, Mayor, Council President, um, Council Member Gordon. Um, we are uh, in a similar place in terms of uh, the kinds of information that the state has and um, making it public. So they are giving us a small uh, look into some of the data and um, the number of cases is uh, part of what we know. We do know the number of deaths. Um, we do know the number of hospitalized. And um, so I, I think it's a matter of um, how, how often we want to release that, knowing that that will be a, a public statement. Um, and as the cases uh, accumulate, it becomes less of an issue for privacy, which was originally a reason why we didn't have access to the to the data, Minneapolis specific data. But I think at this point, um, we can talk about at what uh, at what periods of time, uh, how often do we want to um, share that information broadly? So, Commissioner. Uh, I, I think probably Council Member Gordon has the same impression as I do. At, at the very least, I think it makes sense to share it in this particular meeting to the extent that we have the data on on the weekly report out. Great. We will we will work to uh, give you the amount of information that we have on a weekly basis through this report. And I wanted to go back and I realized I didn't fully answer Council Member Fletcher's question on on where can one get or how does one make those cloth masks? The CDC has a, um, a whole guide on their website about different ways to make those masks, include sewing and folding uh, mechanisms that, that would just use bandanas. And uh, we have made that available um, to communities and we can make sure that, that that's shared with all of you as well. Thank you. Next. Councilmember Gordon. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. Next we have Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to um, lift up. Um, Commissioner Musicant mentioned that uh, there's been outreach to convenience stores and um, in small, smaller grocery stores. And I really, really, really appreciate that uh, going out and providing that guidance. Uh, I'm really grateful for our regulatory services staff as well as public health, public health staff. I really wanna just emphasize how important it is that we continue to target um, various communities with um, culturally appropriate um, messaging around um, distancing, around um, this newest um, um, guidance around masks and how to wear the mask, how to obtain the mask, etc. We know that a lot of times these communities are not responding to the one size fits all kinds of um, messaging and communication. So um, I know that we are doing um, media outreach to these communities, but if we can continue to make posters, um, social media types of communications to specifically for the Latino community, the Native American community, African American communities, et cetera, to make sure that we are getting um, these these uh, really helpful messages out. And so uh, I'm expressing gratitude and, and really um, hoping that we can continue to expand that um, specific kind of messaging to, to communities that are being really, um, that nationwide are being really hit 
hard and we know that in our city uh, the inequities are um, horrendous to, to really um, state it bluntly and we need to be doing everything we can to make sure that we are reaching out to those communities. Thank you. Thank you. We have Council Member Cunningham in queue next before we move on to the next section. Thank you, Madam President. Um, just uh, deepening the uh, comment by Council Vice President Jenkins, um, I wanted to actually ask if there has been any specific uh, connection and um, outreach to community-based organizations that have relationships in various cultural communities throughout the city to be able to uh, more specialized messaging, be able to do um, community specific outreach um, and specific community specific messaging. Has there been any sort of uh, work that has been done related to that? And um, if not, what are some of the things that we can do as council members to be able to help support those efforts? Uh, Madam President, Council Member Cunningham, yes, there has been extensive outreach to cultural communities and certainly additional assistance would be welcome. Um, <clears throat> In addition to some of the statistics that I gave out in, in the la in last week's report, I've got a communication section as part of this agenda as well. Um, and perhaps we can have uh, Mr. Rubidor expand even beyond with what is in that communications section. That's all. I am happy to put a pin in my question until we get to that slide. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mayor. Why don't you uh, go ahead um, from here? Thanks. Thank you, Madam President. The next section we're looking at is the Office of Emergency Management and Workforce Report. Uh, the city's workforce availability continues to maintain essential functions of government, and I've said it before, the city has to be the government that does not shut down, and we will continue with our core city services regardless of how this pandemic plays out. Our daily rate of workers on duty is consistently between 89 and 91% of the total workforce, which is really a staggering figure when you think about it, and it's something we're very proud of. And of those, approximately 79% of workers on duty are working remotely. Now that figure excludes both police and fire, but to have 79% of our workforce working remotely, and then approximately 90% of our workforce that is working on a daily basis through this pandemic is something that I think collectively we should all be really proud of. And this success rate can in large part be attributed to the extraordinary work uh, from our IT, uh, our IT team, and they've facilitated the city's capabilities to work from remotely in an amazing way um, and we're we're really proud of them uh, you know the, the the fact that we are presently having um, a very important and significant council meeting remotely with ability to access online i think is something we should be proud of and uh, but by the way we're moving well beyond that uh, the delivery of essential services to our customers remains robust and with the support of, of HR, we've been able to reassign personnel to different departments and support the unique work we're experiencing during this pandemic. And finally, uh, OEMs, the Office of Emergency Management's efforts remain focused on the situational awareness of trends, impacts, as well as the resources that may become available, as well as the resources that we presently have to share. You know, I think it makes sense that we collectively as a state are working together right now because we're going to need to deploy resources to where they are needed most. Uh, and we, of course, will ultimately be beneficiaries of that as well. Uh, procurement. We signed uh, emergency regulations, as you know, that offered uh, city leaders and, and myself as mayor more flexibility in the procurement process in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, to date, the total spend through April 7th, uh, so that would be a couple days ago, uh, was $971,714. That's just in procurement, to be clear. There are obviously more monies that are spent beyond that. Uh, that is an increase of roughly 300,000 from last week, which can be attributed in, in large part to CPED payments through its small business team and under the BTAP program. Um, I will also note that if we haven't signed this contract yet, we are in the process of, of, of additionally making sure that we are protected against uh, cyber attacks. 
Um, that was an element and an aspect that we pushed hard for in last budget and the council were big supporters of. Now in the time of COVID-19, we're seeing hackers come through the woodwork. Uh, and we need to be safe as a city, both institutionally as well as financially. And the protections added there to the tune of, I believe, $175,000 uh, will go towards that end. Um, any questions before I move on to the state and federal activity? Mayor, I think you can go ahead and we'll collect the questions for the end. Great. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the stay at home order has obviously been extended at this point until May 4th. Uh, this recent order also allows for some businesses to reopen that do not pose clear risks to the spread of COVID-19. Uh, some examples were lawn care services. Uh, that was one provided by the governor. Um, I know I and our city is very supportive of this work and, and all the, though these measures are significant, they are necessary to save lives. And when you see the statistics on the, you know, 17 per 100,000 cases, which, you know, may have gone up in the last couple of days, that's, uh, that it's working. You know, it is, it is working, but we need to keep our nose to the grindstone. Um, at the Minnesota legislature, uh, the, the legislature was in session on April 7th, where both the House and the Senate passed legislation that specifically addresses workers' compensation claims for employees who contract COVID-19 during their duties as frontline workers. So healthcare workers, home healthcare workers, paramedics, emergency medical technicians, police officers, firefighters, those are all included as frontline workers and the city has been actively engaged in the conversation around funding this expansion. Uh, unfortunately, the funding was not addressed in the bill that was passed on Tuesday, but our IGR team I know is hard at work, uh, and I'm hopeful that a work group will continue to come together to recognize how important these funding mechanisms are, especially to local municipalities. Uh, you know, I mentioned in the last check-in that cities above a 500,000 uh, population were eligible to apply directly and receive aid directly from the federal government, where as cities below 500,000, and we are barely below, uh, will have to receive aid through the state. This aid is going to be critical for our municipality, uh, and I know our IGR team is hard at work in ensuring that those allocations are passed through and that they are received by our city. Uh, elections. Next up. This is a, another important discussion as we are muscling our way through this pandemic and we've got both primaries and general elections coming up. Uh, this week, Secretary of State Steve Simon uh, advocated before the House Subcommittee on Elections to ensure the conduct of safe elections during this time of, of pandemic. Uh, this is a really important piece of legislation that will help us avoid the problems that we saw facing Wisconsin earlier this week. Specifically, you know, the legislation would uh, result in registered voters automatically receiving a ballot in the mail remotely, which would be a reduction in the number of polling places on Election Day and add extra time allotted for election administrators to process ballots. People should not have to choose between participating in democracy and protecting their health. Uh, and this bill goes a long way towards that. Final, finally, on the federal topic, uh, agencies continue to work on releasing the funds, uh, guidance and waivers that were appropriated through the CARES Act, which came out just earlier. The city has received guidance in regard to uh, emergency services grants or ESG, uh, and we're coordinating with Hennepin County on the deployment of those additional funds. We want to make sure that we're working together as ESG funds are allocated to the services they are needed where they are needed most. Uh, and that's in addition to the guidance and waivers for the increase that we may see for community development uh, block grants. Uh, we're continuing to wait on additional guidance for various agencies who expect to deploy the funding opportunities within the next few weeks. Uh, as far as local coordination goes, one of the main aspects we're coordinating on is homelessness. Uh, we are currently 
in quickly evolving discussions with Hennepin County. Uh, I know Council Vice President and Council President have been involved as well. Uh, and this is as to the next step to support people experiencing homelessness. The, the public health risks are, they are challenging. And I don't think that needs additional explanation when large numbers of people are congregating either in shelters or in unsheltered homelessness that definitively causes uh, an issue with additional transmission. Uh, so we are formulating plans through a variety of options, uh, such as safe day locations like the one that's set up over at Curry Avenue uh, or more intensive options like increased shelter capacity uh, and as soon as we've got an agreed upon course of action, I'll be updating you with that plan as well. Uh, of course, I always welcome feedback. Um, next is the, uh, I guess, Thank the updates you, on the, yes, I'll stop. Uh, I know we're shifting to an, another sort of larger topic. So I see Councilmember Fletcher has a question or comment on the last section. Thank you, Council President. Um, Mayor, I wanted to go back to the uh, workers' comp question. Because uh, I'd seen a little bit of messaging from the League of Cities around uh, the question about where the funding is for this. And I want to first sort of take the opportunity to promote an under-promoted aspect of the federal bill, which is that uh, it covers uh, 10 days of uh, paid sick time uh, for uh, COVID-related time off uh, that you can take out of your uh that you can deduct from your payroll taxes that are due and i want to make sure that small businesses know about that because that's something that we've talked less about um in our in in our messaging and in everybody's messaging i think to to businesses generally but want to make sure that uh it's just noted as a part of this and then I, i'm to make sure that i'm understanding the workers comp component of this the only people who would need to be able to claim workers comp were people who had COVID related complications that stretched beyond a two week illness, correct? Because uh, because the federal uh, sick time uh, would cover us for uh, a mild case of COVID. It's more if, if it develops into uh, pneumonia or hospitalization or other sort of, long, you know, bigger consequences that workers comp would kick in. Madam President, Council Member Fletcher, the workers' comp legislation is so complex and confusing that it may take five lawyers at times to determine what is and what is not covered. Um, uh, but I do think there's some additional clarity, especially in recent days, around what cities are required to consider as workers' compensation and the incidents that would that would trigger uh, workers' compensation. Um, as I'm going to kick it to Mr. Ranieri to answer the specifics on Council Member Fletcher's question, um, which I believe is what is funded and what is not. Is Mr. Ranieri on the line? Mr. Mayor, this is Mark Ruff. I can answer um, in Jean's in Jean's stead. Um, I think you're right, uh, Mr. Mayor, that. Um, this is complicated um, to Council Member Fletcher's uh, comment. It is true that the federal government is covering the cost for private businesses for the COVID leaves. It is not covering the cost for for uh, municipal uh, costs associated with that. Uh, so that is uh, one complication. And then the second is just that um, as far as city employee workers compensation, which are primarily firefighters and police officers in that case, um, it, it, the workers' comp would, would essentially take the place of any federal leave. So there is immediate exposure as opposed to longer term exposure on those cases. And I think the League of Minnesota Cities and our IGR team are working closely uh, together with state officials to establish some type of funding mechanism um, where the state can use some federal dollars to help offset those costs, but those negotiations have not been concluded at this time um, and so there is uncertain funding for us um, in that particular case irregardless we will endeavor as you all instruct us to to take care of our employees to make sure they are as safe as possible to prevent as much as possible the contraction of this of this disease and we will continue to do that thank you Mayor, I don't see any other questions on this section, so I think we can move on to the next portion. Thank you for the question. Um, 
The next topic is gap funding, which we have largely covered in the last report out. Uh, but in total, as you know, there is $5 million, more than $5 million for renters, for families, for workers, and for businesses that have been hardest hit by this crisis. And uh, our primary goal is really to make sure that these programs and dollars complement, not duplicate the work that is done at both the state and the federal legislatures. And those dollars go to those that are in need of them most, to those that are hardest hit, and to those that are our most, our most vulnerable populations. And so that means in housing, we're going to the, the deepest levels of AMI. Uh, for businesses, we're going to the businesses that are the smallest, uh, least revenue, and at some point the most on the brink. Um, so for an up-to-date information is available on the city's COVID-19 funding web pages and in multiple languages. And this is now talking about the housing piece and formats will be disseminated widely as the application is finalized. We believe that the housing piece will be uh, up sometime in mid-April, uh, and we will be able to get you information on that ASAP. As for the small business piece, they are in the final testing phase right now. Uh, we're in the process of making sure that both the application itself uh, as well as um, as well as other necessary tools are translated um, to several different languages. And we felt that, you know, it would be better to to get this right than to get this done uh, quicker. And so we're we're taking the time to do this correctly. We believe that this should be our goal is to be ready to launch this later today. Uh, now, uh, I, I, I say that with some reservation as um, I want to make sure that when the application process is up and running, we're actually able to take applications and nobody is excluded and everybody has the ability to understand through proper translation. Uh, but the goal, the goal is uh, late this afternoon or early this evening. Um, again, it is possible that that could be pushed till Monday, but we're working furiously on it right now. I'm going to pause there uh, as I know there may be questions on the gap funding package generally i'm happy to answer council vice president jenkins thank you so much madam president um mayor fry there's been just a lot of discussion about the one million dollars that um was dedicated to the stable home stable schools initiative um and I'm just hoping that you can clear up any misconceptions about the gap funding to help the public understand that um, families whose children go to charter schools or whatever schools are, if they meet the income um, qualifications, they are certainly um, allowed to access uh, the $2 million emergency housing fund. I think it's really important. The, the, the messaging that is going around is that certain families are being left out. I don't think that's true, but I really hope that you can explain it a little bit better. I've been trying to explain it to people. It seems like they don't want to accept my explanation, so maybe they will accept it from a white guy who is the mayor. Council Vice President, uh, Madam President, Council Vice President, uh, you are right. Uh, there has been quite a bit of misinformation out there. The message, Council Vice President, that you have been relaying is absolutely accurate. Uh, that misinformation has been very unfortunate. Let me be clear, of the new monies dedicated in that $2 million emergency rental assistance package, 100% of it, every single dollar is available to all families throughout the city, regardless of where their kids go to school. $2 million in the new emergency rental assistance available to all families, regardless of where they go to school. Now, there are income restrictions, 
there are restrictions in that the family needs to have suffered from some form of COVID-19 related issue. Uh, but that $2 million is not limited. So if you are a lower income person that goes to a charter school or for that matter, a, a private school even, um, you may apply for those $2 million. Now, as you know, we have an already existing program, which is Stable Homes, Stable Schools. Uh, and that program serves low income communities within our public school system. It's a partnership with the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority, with the YMCA, uh, and with Minneapolis Public Schools, as well as many private philanthropies. And that in, that partnership allowed us to have an infrastructure that was already set up prior to COVID-19 that could quickly serve families in need. Now, we're not gonna just dismantle that infrastructure because of COVID-19, that would hurt families. So we need to keep that infrastructure in place. The monies, no new monies were devoted to stable homes, stable schools. Now, monies were shifted from one side of the ledger that was focused on long-term homelessness to the other side of the ledger that was focused on emergency rental assistance because we found that that was where the demand was located within stable homes, stable schools. Uh, but you know, this is an important program. It's one that I stand by 100%. Uh, and we're able to help families throughout the city as well uh, through the rest of the programs that, that we've set up. Um, and I think that's a really important, that's a really important component. And so we're, we were, in this case, we're able to do both, not to mention, you're not gonna be able to double dip. Um, so if you're pulling from one, you're not gonna be able to pull from the other, where we need to help the families that are, that are struggling the most. And that is how this entire program uh, has been set up. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I, I hope people really hear this messaging. Do you know, is there demographic data on who is accessing stable homes, stable schools resources to date? Uh, Madam President, Council Vice President, yes, there is demographic data. Last I checked, there were, this isn't exactly demographic data, but there were somewhere in the range of six or 700 kids that were being served. That number goes up dramatically and probably has even since COVID-19 has started. Um, you know, I don't wanna misquote. Um, what I will say is that a very significant portion of that total number are uh, communities of color. Um, but I, I don't wanna mis misstate the, the number and we, I can make sure that Andrea in a way from my office gets you the, that data immediately. I would appreciate that very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam President, and uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for that additional information about stable homes, stable schools. Um, I am curious um, so that folks understand um, the process for stable homes, stable schools. Um, the, the traditional process with the system that has been set up is for a referral through the child school counselor. So now um, given this uh, new reality of uh, distance learning, will the stable homes, stable schools dollars be um, through the same um, online application as the $2 million emergency right. assistance. Um, will that be different? And um, will it still be focused um, specifically on families that are experiencing homelessness? Or is it fo families that are falling within the 30% and impacted by COVID-19? Just for clarification. Uh, Madam President, Council Member Cunningham, I, I can answer the first part of your question, uh, which is, is it through the same application process? The answer is no. We still have our, the, a separate application process, which is just the Stable Home, Stable Schools program continuing. We're not going to change everything for the face of, of COVID-19. So that, that will continue. Um, I didn't quite, uh, and so we'll have a, another application process that'll come out mid-April that we were talking about for the additional um, $2 million that we've put in. Um, I, I didn't quite understand the second part of your question. So if you can perhaps. 
Yes, excuse me. Um, so I'm I'm curious um, if it if the state or I would like clarification as maybe the better way to say it um, around um, if the one million dollars will still be focused um, on families who are homeless and highly mobile, or will it be opened um, to families um, that maybe aren't experiencing that, but fall within the criteria that um, are in place for the $2 million um, of emergency housing assistance. I think I understand your question. So the monies within stable home, stable schools have been moved from the from the pot serving families already experiencing homelessness on a long term basis. So uh, constant rental assistance on a long term basis and been moved over to the emergency rental assistance for families that have fallen on hard times uh, that need an additional that need additional assistance in the immediacy. Um, the criteria, all of it is prioritizing the lowest income students. And that, and that is the case with stable homes, stable schools. That is also the case with the $2 million that have been allocated for emergency rental assistance in the face of COVID-19. All of it is targeting the lowest income students. Uh, as you know, the existing formula that we had prior to COVID-19 on the stable home, stable school side was 50% of AMI and under. Um, Again, though, the, the priority will go to those at the deepest levels and the lowest incomes that we have. Great. Thank you so much for the additional information. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. With that, Mayor, I think we can move to the next section. Great. So I believe I already stated the piece about the small business funding hopefully being uh, done by later today. Uh, the next item on the docket what is communication. Um, and given that I see uh, David Rubidor in the, in the lobby, I may call on him in just a second to provide a further answer to Councilmember Cunningham's previous question. Um, so communication remains positive uh, and, and fruitful through various avenues, including the policy group, uh, the council and mayor's office staff calls, department head calls, and there's many structured and unstructured meetings that we've had both informally and formally through Skype and, and FaceTime and Team and all of the other devices that I'm not familiar with. Uh, and so thanks to all of you for, for all of your support and the conversations. Uh, that gap funding package continues to receive uh, feedback, good feedback. And um, since the announcement last Friday, we've conducted eight taped or live interviews in the last several days to continue providing accurate information. Uh, we've also amplified a campaign from Minneapolis Public Housing Authority soliciting cloth mask donations for public housing uh, maintenance and staff. And so much of the work that we're doing focuses on cross jurisdictional lines. So we've been working especially hard with the park board highlighting the importance of continuing to follow the stay at home order uh, to you know, stay off the playgrounds, not congregating in large numbers, making sure that we're not playing sports that are conducive to the spread of, of COVID-19. Uh, and I know my team is also working lockstep with the city communications department to continue promoting new vehicles for information, including the COVID-19 newsletter and website. Um, to Councilman Cunningham's uh, earlier comment, there have been there's been quite a bit of, of outreach and uh, a pretty, as I recall, a pretty staggering statistic as to the number of community oriented meetings that we've held and outreach that we've done. Uh, but I'll turn it over to a combination of first David Rubidor and perhaps then if, if Commissioner Musicant wants to chime in as well. Uh, this is uh, David Rubidor. Would you like me to go forward with um, a brief summary of what we're what we're working on? If you could give a brief Hello. summary, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, council members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to give you uh, an update. Um, our team has been doing a lot of work uh, to really make sure that all the communities in the city are actually connected and getting information. Um, so what that has entailed is. Uh, we have staff that are actually in the joint information system working directly with communications. Uh, Nick No and Cheyenne Brodine are, are uh, embedded into that group. Um, Nick is running all the translation um, services out of that group. 
uh, with the intent on really making sure that the information is getting translated into all the different languages as it's coming out of the city. And then Cheyenne is there also helping to coordinate just really um, the work between our department and communications on, on uh, making sure that we're um, uh, really connecting our work collect, um, um, directly with the, uh, with the communication work. We also have two staff that are over in the health department. We have Anthony Taylor and E. Um, Burnett that are located over there, uh, working with their community engagement work as well. And so I feel like um, our staff are really well connected into both the, um, systems in the city that are um, directly responsible for addressing the COVID work. So what's happening right now is, uh, I think a number of you actually participated on the community briefings. We had a series of five uh, conversations with community members. The mayor attended, uh, was able to attend all of them, as well as a number of council members. Really with the intent, I mean, Greta Musicant um, uh, was there as well. Really with the intent on making sure that we are getting community, uh, information out to community leaders and various cultural communities, as well as the senior community and the GLBT community. Um, so that those occurred. Uh, we um, are currently doing a number of radio shows. Uh, we all, we, we, we've had radio shows with uh, um, three different uh, language uh, radios, um, Spanish Hmong and Somali, as well as the African American community. We have set that up now. So that is actually happening um, weekly instead of before it was happening either bi-weekly or monthly. So that is happening weekly. Uh, our staff are also continuing to uh, uh, go to other radio shows as well really trying to get the information out that people need, um, working with communications on social media. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are working with a number of like uh, religious leaders, a lot of uh, cultural partners around the city, our staff are on the phone um, in virtual meetings pretty much all day, working to making sure that we're uh, um, getting the information out to the different communities in the city. So there's been a lot done. We are, our staff are embedded in Basically, the work that's going on with the city, um, the, I think those, those um, systems are well set up um, and there's a lot of activity. I could get into a little bit more specifics if you like, but overall, that's, that's the overall setup of work, how we're working at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rubidor. Well, oh, sorry, Council President. Oh, no, that's all. Thank you. Councilor Cunningham, did you have a follow-up question? Yes, I do. Thank you, Madam President, and uh, thank you, Mr. Rubidor, for that information. Um, I will say that um, in North Minneapolis, and this was something that came up during the uh, cultural community briefings, um, but I just want to make sure that we're stating it in a larger forum. In North Minneapolis, um, this issue is not being taken um, quite as seriously as is necessary. So um, one of the things that um, that I think would be effective is like large signs in critical areas. Like I see folks in groups walking down Penn, congregating at Penn and Lowry. I know that the same is happening um, in uh, I, I know that the same thing is happening on Broadway, for example, um, large signs that are dispelling myths. So, for example, um, and, and stating facts, like so really acknowledging that actually this disease, uh, this virus is not um, race specific. In fact, it's disproportionately negatively impacting um, Black Americans, I think, is necessary for folks um, on the North side to understand. Um, additionally, um, information about um, like, you know, like there, there's kind of a myth that if you don't get sick regularly, then this won't affect you. You got a good immune system. And that just doesn't apply in this particular case with a with a novel virus like this. And so, um, you know, I just think that like visual cues are going to be really impactful um, in key areas. Uh, I don't know if that means partnering with organizations like Juxtaposition to be able to make it eye-catching. Um, 
but I, I do think though that it's really critical that uh, we have specific messaging. Um, I can really largely speak to the, the black community since uh, North Minneapolis um, does have a large black community, but I'm sure that we're having issues um, in other communities as well that's similar. So I'll just say that a lot of Northsiders aren't you know, going to be getting the COVID-19 newsletter, you know, with all due respect, it's helpful for the folks who do seek out that information, but the everyday folks that are still congregating, still playing basketball, still, you know, hanging out um, out, out in the community and in and, and groups, um, I think that it's important for, we, for us to meet folks where they are. So um, something like a visual cue uh, would be helpful. And so I just wanted to provide that feedback uh, based on the lived experience experience over here on the north side. Thank you. Council President, uh, uh, may I respond? Yes, sure. Yes, thank you, Mr. Rivera. Uh, Council President and uh, Council Member uh, um, uh, Cunningham, uh, that, those are great suggestions. Thank you for um, uh, providing those. Uh, the one thing uh, regarding the community briefings that was really um, quite compelling was that each community is faced with different issues and kind of different needs within this crisis. And the, really the need to be able to tailor our response um, to address those types of specific issues. So one of the things that's coming out of the community uh, briefings is that we are, we have summarized what we heard and that information is going to get pa uh, getting passed to um, um, other partners within the city. The health department was uh, clearly on those calls as, as you may recall. Um, the other thing is, is uh, within the health department's community engagement work, as I mentioned, we have two staff people that are there as well. Um, and I think this issue has come up in that group. Um, and uh, maybe Commissioner Musican can address this a little bit more than I can, kind of working directly with them. But I know it's come up within that group about how to get out to sites and locations where people are still gathering, where information or at least conversations could occur in order to help um, people better understand. So. The notion around, um, in, uh, as you were saying in North Minneapolis, about what that means specifically to that community is vitally important. I think we all recognize that. Um, those suggestions are great. Uh, we'll pass those along as well. Um, and I think they are already talking about uh, ways in order to be able to address that. I know um, some of my staff were talking about directly about how you get out to those sites. One, to protect uh, the city staff, uh, making sure they're protecting themselves while they're there but then also to talk to people about the importance of not congregating or not um, uh, coming together in a specific area. Um, so uh, great suggestions, just wanted to mention that and just wanted to mention, I, I believe those conversations have already, were, they're already starting to work on those and address those, but those are some great ideas, so thank you. Thank you, um, Madam President, if I may just follow up one last time. Sure, yep. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Rubador. Um, I, you know, th there's a loaded, um, there, there's a, a loaded history around um, the state not telling Black folks to not congregate. So I think that there does have to be some some sort of sensitivity around that as well. So I just want to also name that. Mr. Mayor, is there any additional information from the parks um, around? Um, taking down basketball hoops um, and like dismantling basketball courts. Do we have any updates around that in particular? Because that's a huge issue for us. Madam President, Councilman Cunningham, the Park Board is presently working on this very issue. Uh, and so I don't want to jump the gun and making any announcement on their behalf, but I can tell you that they're hard at work at it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, uh, and I do see that Commissioner Musicant uh, would also like to um, address some of the questions briefly. Yes, so Commissioner you. Musicant, uh, please go ahead. And I know, yes. I know this is a topic where we've had a lot of emails go out and a frequent um, topic at the ward check-in meetings. So I know that there's been a lot of back and forth about how we can improve our communications, and that many staff are working on it. So I think it's clearly something for f further follow-up after the council meeting. But would love to hear the brief update that you have to share from the health department's perspective as well. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you. I just wanted to build on what uh, David Rubidor has already been saying. Um, Council President, thank you. Um, we are um, the 
you, part of the business that you will be conducting later today is to uh, accept a grant that from the state of Minnesota uh, for COVID response, and we'll be using 100,000 of that um, to uh, get grants, small grants out to community organizations for the very reasons that you have talked about, that folks out in the community know what kinds of strategies are needed, and uh, we'll be able to help uh, support those activities. Um, we are also uh, working with the Youth Coordinating Board on messaging, particularly for youth, and some of our existing contract uh, relationships that are addressing um, violence prevention are also working to get uh, social media messages out, and we are working with a, a group of 10 um, organizations that we have memorandums of understanding with um, to also, because they were chosen, because they are key uh, kind of cornerstones in, in various parts of our community to uh, be messengers as well. So um, it's it's great to have these kinds of two-way uh, communication so we can hear what the needs are and so that we can also share the information that we have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, I think that brings us to the next section, Mayor. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the final section here is uh, cost containment measures. Uh, and you know, as you know, we presently are projected to suffer between a, a hundred million and two hundred million dollars in loss. And that's everything from licensing and fees to fines to uh, sales tax revenue and um, all of our revenue sources to some extent will have lower in some cases significantly lower dollar figures than they did during the same weeks and months last year. Uh, and so to do best by our city and to do right by our city employees, it makes sense to take significant action now to prevent significant loss later. Uh, and in those cost containment efforts, we've taken several measures. The first is a, is a hiring freeze. At my direction, Finance and Property Services and Human Resources have implemented a, a hiring fee, a freeze effective March 31st. Uh, this freeze applies to all hiring and a process is presently in place to facilitate a review of potential waivers to that general rule. Uh, the granting of these waivers will have a relatively high bar to meet. Uh, but we do want to allow for, in some cases, hiring to take place where it's necessary for some COVID-19 related action. Uh, the, there's also been a freeze of discretionary spending and discretionary expense. Uh, finance has frozen all expenditures on non-essential training, on travel, and non-essential operating expenses. That means food, advertising, printing, etc. Uh, and FPS will also be working with departments to understand which expenses from these categories will be essential. So we continue the essential spending and we put a suspension on the discretionary. Also necessary has been a delaying of large purchases. Uh, finance has been working with a fleet, uh, information technology, uh, property services to determine which of our internal service work and that includes like large purchases of equipment, software, other projects, fleet cars. Uh, that should be put on hold until our financial picture becomes clear uh, and that clarity may not be gained for a chunk of time. Uh, departments will be included in conversations to determine which of these activities must proceed and which may be paused. Uh, finally, beginning at the highest levels of leadership in the enterprise, I've authorized uh, the Human Resources Department to begin the process to implement cost containment uh, of our payroll costs. Uh, this includes a wage and step freeze for the remainder of 2020. Uh, and all of 2021 for the appointed positions, politically appointed positions and non-represented positions, and a request for city council action will occur next week for, for city council actions on, on, on those employees as well. Uh, I've also asked our labor relations staff and our, our labor leaders to address the wages 
uh, of represented employees with our labor leadership to accomplish the goal of payroll cost containment for the represented employees as well. This has got to be something that we're all in together. Uh, and taking these necessary actions now will help save jobs later. Um, and I expect these, these decisions uh, will occur over the next month. So in conclusion, I continue to remain positive in, in the face of some really tough days. The collaboration between staff, elected leaders, and partners outside of City Hall has been outstanding. Uh, so I'll wrap up. Thank you all for the opportunity to join you today. If there's any questions about this final section, I'm happy to answer. Uh, and I appreciate your partnership and service so very much. Thank you, Mayor. We do have Councilmember Fletcher in queue to make a comment or question. Thank you, Council President. Uh, Mayor, not about this last section, but about something that wasn't in the presentation that I'm hoping you can address briefly. Uh, the um, one of one of the aspects of enforcing social distancing is uh, creating some new protocols around uh, police and giving police an opportunity to stop people um, under pretexts that they normally wouldn't be able to. And uh, uh, I'm wondering if you can briefly address how that enforcement's being approached. Are, are we actually issuing citations for people being out on non-essential business? Uh, are uh, police using those powers? Are we still in an education phase? Do we plan to stay in an education phase? What's, what's happening with uh, the policing aspect of creating physical distancing? Madam President, Council Member Fletcher, good question. Uh, first, we have diverted the vast majority of COVID related social distancing calls from 911 to 311. The MPD took the lead on pushing a lot of those calls over to make sure that the response uh, was equivalent to what people were actually seeing on the ground. Um, second, as you know, we are prioritizing both education and outreach. Now that can escalate to more significant penalties in the forms of, of fines or even arrest, but again, that is a last resort. The prioritization is on engagement, education, uh, and outreach, and we know how a fine of say $1,000 could have a disproportionate impact on our lower income communities and communities of color, and that's something that we wanted to avoid. As of just a couple of days ago, there had not been any fines nor arrests that had been made. Uh, and so it had been 100% around outreach and engagement. Now that may have changed within the last couple of days, uh, but I haven't. I, I I can get you the the numbers as of right now. But as of as of not very long ago, there everything had been geared toward education and outreach, um, and calls. At least 311 calls were pretty widely dispersed throughout the city that we were getting. Council members, that answer your question. Uh, it does. Thank you. Thank you. And we can also um, perhaps ask for some detail on that on the next week's update. Council Vice President. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the mayor and and all of you for for helping the mayor to um, respond to this crisis in a timely and uh, equitable manner and, and reporting back to the council. Um, just really appreciate all of your efforts and, um, you know, we are in very tough, um, unprecedented times. And I, I think our response has been very appropriate um, and want to just lift up your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. That looks like the last question or comment. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, for all of your work and for um, giving us this update today. We will see you again next week, but I uh, really appreciate how communicative you've been with me and the Council Vice President and all of our colleagues. Um, I know that we have been in the sprint mode of responding to the most urgent needs very quickly, but uh, as you and I have talked about many times, that you know the impacts of this will be with us for a long time. And so as we shift more into that groove of this rhythm of a new reality with virtual meetings and 
planning for the long term impacts to our budget and to our policy work. I really appreciate your leadership and partnership very much. So thank you. And I appreciate you. Thank you. So that concludes this presentation for this week. Um, with if there are no objections, I'll direct the clerk to file that report. And that will bring us to the regular order of business, which begins with the reports of our standing committees. We'll begin with the report of the Business Inspections and Zoning Committee, which will be given by that committee's chair, Council Member Goodman. Good morning. The Business Inspections and Zoning Committee has 14 items that we're moving forward for approval this morning. Item number one is appointments to the Zoning Board of Appoint Adjustment. Item number two is a change in our liquor catering license ordinance. Item three are a couple of changes to our administrative issuance of licenses ordinance. Item four are changes to our tow truck service fee ordinance. Item number five are the liquor license approvals and six are the gambling license approvals. Item seven are the gambling license renewals. Item number eight is a rental license reinstatement at 3511 Colfax Avenue North. Item nine are a number of bids for electrical services within our rental repair program. Item number 10 is a contract with the watershed Mississippi uh, watershed management organization uh, for partnering with them on conducting illegal discharge sampling activities. Item 11 is a vacation resolution correcting uh, a previous action. Item number 12 is a rezoning at 911 Lowry Avenue Northeast. Item number 13 is a rezoning at 2801 Hennepin Avenue East. And item number 14 are all of the liquor license renewals for April 7th. With that, Madam President, I'll move items 1 through 14 for approval this morning. Thank you. Councilmember Goodman has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Vice President Jenkins. Aye. Council Member Schrader. See there. Council Member Schrader. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmisano. Aye. Council Member Schrader. That doesn't count. Council Member Bender. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That carries and the report is adopted. Council Member Schrader has chimed in to the chat that he is having issues with his microphone. Um, so he could be recorded as an aye if that's OK with the clerk. Otherwise, the, the items have passed uh, without his vote as well. Um, so I'll leave that to the clerk. The next report is from our Policy and Government Oversight Committee. I'll ask the Vice President to present that report, which will be quite lengthy as it has all of the other items that come through the Council. So I'll turn it over to the Council Vice President for that report. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the POGO Committee brings forward a total of 35 items this morning. Item number one is confirming the Appointment of Mark Ruff to the appointed charter position of city coordinator, which was unanimously, unanimously passed by both the executive committee and the POLO committee. Items number two and three are the approval of legal settlements negotiated by the city attorney's office. Item number four authorizes the city to intervene as a party to the center point energy rate case before the Public Utilities Commission. Item number five is the approval of a um, contract of a total amount not to exceed $300,000 with Paradigm Counseling for Domestic Violence Outreach Triage Services. 
Item number six is the passage of an ordinance that adds new sections to the city's emergency management code by establishing succession plans for elected policymakers in the event of an emergency. Item number seven is the passage of a resolution to approve a new form um, contract for commissions on public works of art as approved by the city attorney, uh, the office of the city attorney. Item number eight approves additional funding of up to $685,000 from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund contingency pool and authorizes a financing agreement for the Exodus 2 project. Item number nine is the passage of a resolution which was amended at committee to authorize a rollover of unspent appropriations. Item number 10 through items number 10 through 18 are all contract amendments for a variety of goods and services, including several related to work for the new public service building project. Item number 19 is the acceptance of a state grant for prevention and management of diabetes, heart disease, and, and stroke um, and appropriations uh, of those funds to the health department. Item number 20 is the acceptance of the sole bid from Riverview Window in the amount of $1.4 million for lead hazard control at various properties. Items number 21 through 27 are contract authorizations for a variety of goods and services. Item number 28 is the acceptance of a grant for police bomb disposal services. Item number 29 is a layout approval and authorization to acquire easements and additional right of way for the downtown East Street project, reconstruction project. Item number 30 is a layout approval and authorization to acquire easements and additional right of way for the Plymouth Avenue North reconstruction project. Item number 31 is a contract amendment with Nice Ride Minnesota to grant permission for the electric bike fleet to be locked to public bike racks. Item number 32 authorizes an RFP for professional management services of the municipal off street, um, I'm sorry, municipal off street parking system. Item number 33 and number 34 authorize acceptance of low bids. First for the Hoyer Heights Street reconstruction project and second for the Linden Yard soil hauling and disposal services and Item number 35 is acceptance of a state grant for COVID-19 response and the appropriation of those grant funds to the health department. Madam President, I move all items for approval. Thank you. Council Vice President has moved the report from the Policy and Government Oversight Committee. Are there any questions or comments on the, that, those items? Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Council Vice President Jenkins. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Council President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and those items are adopted. I will recognize Council Member Schrader who is back on the audio. We do need council members to record their votes uh, verbally. So I'll recognize you Council Member Schrader. I, rec I realize you wanted to um, record your vote for the last items on, on the bids committee. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I would and like my uh, vote included. I am fortunately had microphone problems right as he called to me. So thanks. I would uh, like to be an eye on the last motion. 
Thank you. Without objection, I'll direct the clerk to record council member Schrader's vote as an aye on the bids committee report. All right, so both of the reports are all adopted. Next, we have the introduction and referral calendar. There's one introduction to make today, which is a motion by Jenkins, Kano, and Ellison to introduce, give first reading to, and refer the subject matter related to the creation the subject matter of an ordinance related to the creation of cultural districts as a new subject in the code of ordinances and that will be referred to the pogo committee in the next cycle are there any questions from council members seeing none clerk please call the roll on that motion council member gordon aye council member cano aye council member reich aye council member fletcher aye council vice president jenkins Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmasano. Aye. Council President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and that item will be referred to the Pogo Committee for the next cycle, which is next Wednesday. That brings us to the order of announcements. Are there any announcements from Council Members? I don't see any. So with that, we have concluded the items on our agenda for this meeting. We have a request for a closed session with the city attorney's office to discuss the litigation litigation matter of Tom Johnson versus the city of Minneapolis. This will be our first closed session in the um, virtual environment. So we'll do things a little differently. The instructions have been sent to council members. And so um, before adjourning this meeting, I will turn it over to the city attorney to explain why the closed session may be closed. Thank you, President Bender. The, this item on the agenda is the legal matter of Tom Johnson versus the city of Minneapolis. The case is an active litigation in federal court. Your lawyers wish to discuss with the council litigation strategy and settlement possibility. Accordingly, under the Minnesota Open Meeting Law, Minnesota Statutes, Section 13D.05, Subdivision 3B, the council may, upon a proper motion, close the meeting for the purposes of attorney-client communications. In considering the motion, the council should weigh the right of the public to know what its government is doing against the need of the city to preserve the confidentiality of your discussions with your attorneys. Thank you. I will move that the meeting be closed pursuant to the open meeting law, Minnesota statute sec section 13D.05 subdivision 3B to discuss the attorney client communications and the litigation matter of Tom Johnson versus the city of Minneapolis. Is there a second? Second. That has been moved and seconded. Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Member Jenkins. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmasano. Aye. Council President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries. So that means we will proceed now to the closed meeting. After that is over, we will reconvene back in this public format to take any action that may be necessary. So thank you all. We will be adjourning to the closed session next. The broadcast of the regular meeting of City Council will now continue. Thank you. Good morning again. My name is Lisa Bender. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council. We have concluded our closed session, so I will reconvene this meeting of the City Council for April 10th and ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify that a quorum is present. Council Member Gordon. Here. Council Member Cano. Council Here. Member Wright. Council Member Reich. Here. Council Member Fletcher. Here. Council Vice President Jenkins. Here. Council Member Schrader. Here. Council Member Cunningham. Here. Council Member Ellison. Present. Council Member Goodman. Present. Council Member Johnson. Here. Council Member Palmasano. Present. Council President Bender. Here. There are 12 members present. We do have a quorum for this meeting. Colleagues, we have a proposed settlement before us to approve the settlement of all claims asserted in Tom Johnson versus the city of Minneapolis 
U.S. District, District Court file, um, which is printed in our agenda, for a payment of $475,000 to Tom Johnson and Pritzker Hagman, PA, and to authorize the city attorney's office to execute any documents necessary to effectuate the settlement and dismissal. Is there a motion to approve that settlement? So moved. Second. That has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Cano. Aye. Reich. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Paul Masano. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and that settlement is adopted. With that, we have concluded all of the items on our agenda for this meeting. With no more business before us, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you all so much for joining us. Happy holidays to those who are celebrating today and this weekend. And we will see you back on Tuesday for the Bids Committee. Thanks.